Uh, well, I do a lot of pen testing. It's just uh, when it comes to CTS in general, I crypto I like just because I'm a big math guy. You know. But pen testing is definitely like its own category, which I really enjoy. What's up? What do you say? It's not a bathroom. It's a hoodie. Yeah, we can. You you should be able to hear yourself on stream. Uh. I don't, yeah, I don't think I can hear you. My OBS isn't showing it. Let me do an audio input capture for you guys. Hmm. So, so why don't you try talking now? I mean, I can always just repeat any questions in Discord. Yeah, I don't think there's much I can do about the stream delay. Oh, wait, I can just not talk in Discord and that should fix it. All right, because you can guys you guys can just hear me on the the stream anyways. I should have added a slide for resources at the end. I'll just post it in Discord.
Hey. So we'll start in a few minutes. I'm just going to give people time to join. Just wondering, can people hear my music or is that just for me? Should it just be for me? Solid. Yeah, so I'll monitor, you just need to tell me how. Oh. There you go. All right, I'll give it another two or three minutes, and then we'll start. Just for, like, a heads up for the people already here, like, nothing's going to be too in-depth today. It's just going to be kind of, like, a brief concept of topics, because there's just so much to talk about that I think focusing on, like, something like RSA or just one thing would be limiting, but then also getting in depth so quick would probably be a little confusing, right? Uh, and this might be a more confusing stream compared to other ones, so any questions are fine. Like, drop it whenever you want. All right, I think uh, now is a good time to start, if any. So this is just a introduction to cryptography, small little stream. 
uh, in preparation for the UMass CTF, right? So during this talk, we're going to be covering basic concepts, uh, and we are going to be going over a few ciphers. Um, the big challenge with cryptography is there's a lot of things to cover, so I can't cover obvi everything, obviously, in two hours. And there is a lot of like mathematical foundations that you can't learn in one night, right? Unless you want to take an entire abstract algebra class, right? It's going to be stuff you pick up over time. And, uh, you know, some concepts might be a little hard to understand. But uh, after the stream, if you ever want to ask me questions or during the stream, uh, it'll be fine, right? So hopefully you guys can come out learning uh, what cryptography is as a general whole. Um, so cryptography at its core, like just a definition, right? Textbook definition, uh, is the study of sending secure messages. So whether that is you're texting your friend on Snapchat or you're sending files to your teacher, um, it can even be you're working for the government and you have top secret information, right? All of these have reasons to be secure and, uh, encrypted, right? You don't want people just anyone looking at this if they're on the same internet network as you, which is very possible in today's world. Um, but so that, that's cryptography, but there's also cryptanalysis, which is basically the same thing, but instead of the study of how to secure it, it's the study of how to break the security messages. So anything you can imagine, uh, the, the stereotypical NSA uh, watching you, right, is all cryptanalysis because usually they'll do it by breaking a flaw in the system or something like that, right? So, in the grand scope of things, there's like two types of cryptography, right? There's classical, which is the study of cryptography like before computers, right? So it's not like it's just a new thing that came up, right? The ancient Romans used cryptography uh, in war, right? They would send stuff to their generals, and you can't let the enemy read your battle plans. Um, and modern cryptography really came with the advancement of computers. So technology has really allowed us to do a lot of things like computations. So now instead of your cryptography being based on shuffling letters, now it's this mathematical proof that has been thoroughly looked at and you know the only way to crack it is if you already know the secret. So there's, there's two very different worlds in it. Uh, in our CTF, we'll have both because both are good to understand and they have very real practical principles. But you know you wouldn't use classical encryption methods to do your Zoom chat, right? That, that's just an awful idea. Um, so we're going to talk about some classical ciphers right now, right? And the very basic one, right? This is one of the first ciphers ever uh, been developed is the Caesar cipher. So basically all it is is you have an alphabet of letters and you just shift them left or right down the alphabet, right? So we're going to go to crypty. Uh, you guys can follow us if you want on your own computer. Right. Uh, and we're just going to select the Caesar cipher mode, right? So just as a very easy example, we're just going crypt A, B, C, D, right? Um, and you can see if we set the shift to one or even zero, we can do, right? Nothing happens. But as we increase the shift, we just go down the alphabet, right? So we do one, A goes to B, B goes to C. Let me actually make it a little bigger for you guys. All right. Um, so the principle behind it is super easy. So that this is what like the type of classical ciphers that we're going to look at. Um, and if we go back to the slides, th this, this type of cipher, right, where you just shift the letters was used by Julius Caesar, right? It's not like this is something we came up with last week. This was used in war and very real practices because 
if this is if if you got a letter that's just random letters and you don't know what it is, this would be a great thing, right? You're passing notes to the person next to you in your elementary school class. Caesar cipher would have you covered. In practicals, if you know nothing about cryptography, this is good enough. But with the rise of computers and stuff like that, it's kind of worthless. And we'll 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 go on that point later, right? But this is like the bare minimum. It's just let me replace one letter with another. Okay. And if we want to make it more complex, right? So if we go back to the Caesar cipher, um, and we were to shift everything down, right? Let me make it bigger again. We shift everything down the same amount. So all we need to do is guess that one number shift, whether it is four, five, or 20. Right. And also another interesting thing that I forgot to mention that uh, is if we go all the way to 26, it wraps back around. Right. So there's only so many possible encryptions with Caesar cipher. But if we were to go to the visionary cipher, right, this one is much similar to Caesar, but it takes a key. So let's go to the slides real quick. Right. So to encrypt, you take a message and your secret key that you don't let people know except the person you want to send the message to. Um, and the way this differs from Caesar is you still use the same shift method, but what you do is you shift every letter a different amount. Right. So if we want to shift the letter A um, by D, so if the first letter in our key is D and the first letter in our message is A, we would replace it with D. Uh, because if you were to make D a numerical value, it would be 4, A1, B2, and so on, right? So if we go to Visionary, uh, and we just did a key of A, right? Four A's. You can see that nothing's changed. But if we were to do a B for the second value in the key, uh, you see that the B has been shifted down one, but everything else stays the same. Seb. Do you want to drop the files we made in the chat? It is a little bit device, so I might have to wait a second. I should, yeah, okay. Um, so we did do two little challenge files, right? So it's just going to be a simple Caesar cipher and a visionary cipher that you're going to be able to crack. And I would recommend using the website Crypty. It's great for basic stuff like this. Um, we should put it in the yeah cryptography channel, the learning one. So I'll just download this on my computer too, and we can look at it. Right, so this is uh, the Caesar challenge. I'm just go copy it and bring it over. So I, I don't know the shift for this one. Seb made the challenge. Um, so just run through it. I'll give you guys like 30 seconds, a minute, whatever you long you need. Can I share the slides? Yeah, let me uh, share the slides. The slides will also be in the crypto. Tell me if that works, okay? Oh, okay. Where is that? All right, whatever. The slides, I, I don't think I have great information, mostly because uh, I made them today. But, uh, you know, I think it's a good starting point just for the basic knowledge. So uh, I'm sure people have had enough time to just do the Caesar cipher, right? So if we just go through all the possible shifts for Caesar cipher, eventually we'll find uh, a decryption, right? Hey, that one looks like English. Crypto is a cool topic. Thank you, Seb. Uh, 
And now if we do the visionary cipher one, which in concept is a lot harder. Right. Oh, Seb, thank you for this. Um, let me just switch over to visionary. Or the decode. So with visionary, again, we have the key, and Seb's given us a, a good portion of it. So we can just copy and paste that. Um, and so the interesting thing about visionary cipher and most classical ciphers is you don't need the entire key to start guessing it, right? And that's one of the faults is you know it will decode to English, right? So you can look for some of the principles of English, right? Two-letter words, uh, what could they possibly be? And then you test out the key values. Or three-letter words, right? Like, what's the chance that the word is uh, the or you or and, right? It, it, there's, like, a statistical way to look at classical ciphers because you know of the limitations. So if we just go by uh, Seb's most probable key, right, we can see that the rest of this message decodes into English. And uh, another thing that you can notice about visionary is... If we were to remove, like a good way to see is if we have just the part that's my name, right? Let me get the correct uh, plain text. Um, this is not the correct plain text. Let me copy and paste again. So if we were to just get part of the key, right? We're missing an entire five letters of it. We can see this much is working, right? But if this was the correct key, it would repeat and continue to work. So we know that the key length must be longer than this uh, due to the fact that only the first few letters are working, right? So that the fact that this part is English lets us know that, you know, we had the first part right, but there's still more to go. And likewise, if we were to do uh, another few letters at the end, we could see it's jumbled but when we remove some, it becomes more clear. So that's, that's a good way to find out the key length because the key length can be arbitrary, right? It can be as long as your message if you want, and then there's very little to go off of. So if we go back to the slides. Um, so visionary cipher was used in France, I believe up till around the 1400s, right? So you had this big gap of Caesar cipher in the Roman empire. 400 BC, right? So there wasn't really a big change in ciphers for almost almost 2,000 years, right? It's, it's still a very basic level, and that's mostly due to the fact that uh, computers aren't a thing, right? You got to keep it simplistic. And the next, like, very famous uh, classical cipher is substitution, right? And instead of shifting every letter, we just replace them. So, right, uh, every instance of A or H or O will just get replaced with another le uh, letter. So do you want to post the plain text for that too? Um, and like in general, it's pretty hard to break substitution ciphers if you know nothing about it, right? Like if you don't know the ways to attack classical ciphers, then this is going to look very hard to you, right? So if we download the challenge let's toss in crypty uh, we're not going to decode anything on here because i don't think crypty has a substitution cipher solver right no um so does anyone know how would you guess it's steven so if we go back to the sorry i just saw that now if we go back to the visionary cipher one right and we didn't have this hint the best way to guess that it started with Steven would again be look at the three letter words, right? What could they possibly be to make sense? Um, because you know it has to decode to readable English. Uh, but there is ways to defend against that. Like if I were to remove all the spaces in my text, right? Then you can't tell how long the words are. Um, and then it gets a lot more secure and a lot harder to break. But that's like a whole other topic of defending, which we will we will get to. 
So if we go back to the substitution cipher, where did I put that? Right, we have this text. Um, does anyone have ideas on how we could look at this to see and break it? Whether you're in Discord or uh, Twitch chat. No ideas? Yep, letter frequency attack is uh, very good. So besides the point that we know this has to decode to English, we know in the English language, it's actually on the next slide, I believe. Uh, in the English language, there is a relative frequency, right? So letters like Z, Q, J aren't used a lot, but the letters E are. Right, an insane amount of the vowels are used. So if we go back, oh, I just had to mute that real quick. Um, so if we go back to uh, this chart, right, we can see what letters are very apparent. And if we go to our ciphertext, right, we see which letters are in here a lot, right? So we know E is in here a lot, H is in here a lot. So those probably decode to very common letters in the English language, such as E, T, H, right? Uh, and then you can also use the statistical analysis of this is probably a three-letter word such as the, or since there's an apostrophe here, that's probably an S, right? Uh, but my favorite method to do this is why do it by hand when someone has always written a tool online to do it for you? Um, so if we go to quip, quip right? I think I put it in the slides if you're looking at them, right? Quipquip.com. And we were to just toss it in here and hit solve, it'll just spit us out the answer because it's a magical tool that does frequency analysis tech, right? So you can look into the source code of this. I, I, I'm not going to go into it, but what it does is essentially um, has looked at thousands of pieces of text Look at the frequency analysis of the spacing, uh, probable words, things like that, and it sees what is the most likely opportunity for the ciphertext to do it. It's really cool. So if you had this tool back in the 1400s or 1600s, you would be paid a ton just to be a cipher breaker, right? Very uh, needed job at the time. So that, that's one of the best ways just to attack any classical cipher. We call them also monoalphabetic because it doesn't shift that frequency, right? There's only one set of alphabet that it goes to. Um, and this would work on Caesar cipher, even though Caesar cipher doesn't really need it, right? So if we copy, let me find it. Nope. I think we'll go out to re-download it. So even if we copy the Caesar cipher, right, it still should be able to solve it because the Caesar cipher is one to one and basically just a simpler substitution. <laughs> um, and that's also uh, something you have to be wary of this tool, right? So it thinks the translation is square do I sing reads because that's statistically more likely. But then if you look at here, you see the crypto, but also nature is just as possible. Um, yeah, so if I want to make my substitution, someone asked for substitution ciphers, can two letters have the same substitution? Uh, yes and no. So if I want to do, um, a, let me pull up one of my favorite tools is just Microsoft Paint to convey things, right? If I want to say A goes to, uh, B in my substitution cipher, but I also want to say like C goes to B. That's perfectly fine, right? That's valid. Um, but the issue with that is, say I now have my ciphertext and I have uh, a B somewhere in it, right? Whether it's two Bs or one, right? I don't know if it can go to A or C. So that leaves a lot of uh, ambiguity. So you just have to make sure 
that uh, you know your message doesn't need to be perfect, or you can infer which letter it is, and that will that will strengthen it. You know. Uh, another question: If you had the cipher text without any information on how is it encrypted, uh, what would you do? So, that that's another good topic, right? So if we go, if you have no information on what the cipher is, um, there's a few ways to look at it. If it's just letters, right? And it's not numbers, it's not just bytes or binary. Frequency tools are great because usually you can tell if it's a frequency tool, it's one of the ciphers I mentioned or something like that. And then from there, you can analyze it more and see like, you know, how the letters add up and uh, if there's groupings. Um, but if it's just random bytes, usually you can't because there's so many possibilities of what it can be encrypted with. Like whether it's a block cipher or uh, a public private system like RSA, you know, it's just too much to think about. Um, so another attack is a known plaintext attack, right? So if I have a substitution cipher, and I know the message starts with uh, maybe the name of one of your friends, right? Uh, it's a text message that you uh, encrypted with substitution cipher, right? If I can guess where the name is in your message, then I have that amount of letters decrypted already, right? And it just makes it exponentially weaker because now I have so much less to uh, guess on. And uh, it's not like these methods are unconventional. If you go back to World War II, Right, we didn't have large computers, and people were still using uh, machines like the Enigma machine. Right, and the Enigma machine was broken by a known plain text attack because they put "Hail Hitler" at the start of it. Um, so for the most part, I think, right, that covers the attacks and the defense. But now you say, like, okay, people use these for hundreds of years. How do they make them any better? Right, you you can't just have a substitution cipher lasts for 150 years and no one break it, right? But you can do that if you defend against them, right? So when we go back to our frequency analysis, right, we notice certain letters come up more. But that also is a downside because, you know, within this letter, t the TH will come up a lot more, right? So... Going back to when people said, uh, when there was the question on, you know, can we do A goes to B or uh, and C goes to B, right? That's one way to do it. But we can also make, if there's a TH as a whole, we can make that go to like a Z, right? Or, you know, if you're doing a system like this, usually you won't encrypt the letters and you'll do symbols like... Uh, You'll do something like that, right? You'll, you'll just just to make it so you have more than twenty six possibilities because you still want it to be one to one, right? So it turns out if we do like th, we do like ea, right? We'll go to another thing, right? Something like that, uh, and then ing is another popular one in the English language, right? So if we do stuff like that, and we go back to our frequency we see that it more or less turns out to be flat, right? All these lines are for different texts. Uh, and there's some variance and stuff, but right, it's a lot better than what we had before. So this makes it almost impossible to attack a substitution cipher without brute forcing everything. You know, and that's comparable to what we have today uh, in terms of modern ciphers with uh, one-time pads and stuff, right? Like if you're mailing a message to someone like this is perfectly reasonable to use but uh if you don't use messages like even if you do use systems like that computers ruin everything right because it's not about if a computer can break these ciphers it's about when right caesar cipher i can break in literally milliseconds okay there's only 26 possibilities uh, visionary cipher grows exponentially with the key length and substitution cipher with, uh, you know, if you do the bigrams and stuff, right? If you go back to doing all this stuff with the TH, um, oh, wrong way. So, you know, substitution cipher looks really good, right? Two to the 88. That's a ton of possibilities. Shouldn't be, uh, possible to brute force. 
But again, we go back to our analysis. And if we use tools like frequency charts, and uh, if we have any idea on plain text, you know, this 88 suddenly becomes 2 to the 20, right? And you can do that an hour on your personal laptop. So that more or less is going to cover our part of today with classical ciphers. Anyone have any questions? I just want to make it clear, like, I didn't, I only covered three ciphers, right? There's a ton. There's a, you can look at a website right now, right? So th this is just one list of all different classical ciphers, right? Rot 13, Virginia, Baconian, uh, and all of these are their own take on how you should, you know, shuffle around letters and do stuff like that. Very little is based on actual uh, binary, right? Uh, and then if we go to, I think Decode FR is a good website, right? And you just go, let's see, here maybe. Let's search one and see if they'll give us more options, right? But this website, I'm pretty sure has, yeah, let's look at, I just searched Seiger and it gives me this many possibilities, right? So there's hundreds of different types of classical ciphers on this website. Whether they're all good, like the other ones, debatable. But, you know, it, it's something that you can make up with your friend, a classical cipher. Um, so if we start talking about modern computing, like, right, and modern cryptography, this really kicks off, I would say, the end of World War II, right? Because currently we, we had proven, right, this Enigma machine thought to be unbreakable we build a computer and it just brute force the daily message and suddenly the allies have such an advantage right so it really shows the the push and power of computers in cryptography right but with that push in computers you also have to make sure that your defense is really good so anything you use now on your computer like on your phone on your tablet uh on your school networks, everything has to be completely secure and mathematically proven, or else, like, what's the point, right? Someone's going to find a vulnerability in it. And one of the ways they really f try to do this with modern computing is a trapdoor function, right? So the idea of a trapdoor function is it's really easy to compute, right? This function. If I have this function f of x, it's really easy to get to that point whether that's through uh, binary equations or just straight up math. But to find what the original value was is really hard unless you have a secret value, right? A key, just like uh, the keys in the visionary, right? It's going to be hard to find your original plain text unless you have the key. Um, but, you know, with modern encryption, this is taken to a whole new level. Now you have thousands of papers and professors looking at how can we break this or how is this uh, impossible to break? You know, so most of modern day encryption is based off the fundamental that we can't find primes easy, right? That's one of the unsolved problems in mathematics is uh, factoring and finding primes. Uh, and then modular arithmetic with finding the log of a mod problem, which we'll talk about later, right? And then there's also, which is weaker but also consuming is uh, binary equations, right? So a lot of modern day stuff is just pure 0 and 1 XOR and gates uh, and that type of stuff just over and over again. So the possibility of reversing it is too computationally complex, right? So the, the main one, if you're talking about binary encryption, is uh, XOR and the one-time pad. So for people that haven't taken CS250, you might not know what XOR is. And it's simply just like a binary operation where it's zero if they are the same thing and if it's one if they're different, right? So the way you would do it is you turn your message into binary. So if I want to send the word, we'll open Python for this, right? If I want to send text, right? Uh, and that's in bytes, and I then convert it to hex, okay? Uh, we'll convert it to an integer in the hex. And then from there, we can just convert it into binary, right? 
So I take this binary string, and then I will generate a, another binary string randomly, right? And that's the whole key point, is that it's random, and I'll XOR it with this. And due to the properties of XOR, right, if we have a 0, we don't know if the input was 0 and 0 or 1 and 1, right? And if we have a 1, we don't know which bit is a 1. So that's the really important thing, because XOR, with the output, you have no idea what the input is, right? It can be any value. Um, so it's an inherently one-way function, right? Going back to our idea of trap door, right? You can't go back. It's very hard to figure out what, what is before. Um, but this also comes with the issue which is screwed up a lot more than you think because we call it the one-time pad for a reason. If I have the same message, right? So if we go Python, and we're going to do message one equals uh, 153, right? And message two equals 207. And then we're going to say our key is equal to eight. So if I do M1, and the caret just stands for XOR key, we know that's 145. And we do M1 or M2 XOR key, right? 199. Let me just make this bigger for you. Right? So those encryptions both seem fine, right? But the thing is, if we do M1 XOR M2, we know that's 86. Uh, and if we do M1 XOR key, actually, let me just copy the integer values, right? So if we do this encryption, 145, with this encryption, 199, we see that suddenly the key cancels out and we're back to M1 XOR M2, right? Which, you know, when it's just numbers like this, doesn't seem like a big deal, right? I can't figure out that 145 XOR 199 was my first few numbers, right? But the inherent flaw goes back to, you know, this is supposed to be a message. So, you know, it's going to be English value. Um, and if we XOR the English, you know, it should become readable. So maybe we guess that, again, my name is in the message somewhere, right? That will reveal the bits of the other message if we're correct. Um, so let me do, right, so we're going to do test XOR. Let me just convert that back into an integer. Key, right, and then we're going to do another one. Uh, hmm, text, right? Uh, and if you were to XOR these together, and let's just convert that to hex for our sake. Um, we see that it's zero, right? And the interesting thing about that, well, there's a B there, but the interesting thing about that is it tells us the first part of the message has to be the same. Because when we XOR, the key cancels out, right? And then we're just XORing these messages, essentially. And since the leading bytes are zero, we know that they must be the same. And that reveals a huge part of the message, right? So if I was to send uh, an email, say, right, and it always started with dear, that pretty much gives away my part, that part of the message. So it's really important that if you were to do something like this, you only use the key once, and then you have to generate a new one. Um, and there's a whole methods on how you should generate what random number generator to be secure, uh, how you agree with the person you're trying to talk to, like what system to use to generate your keys. But that's like one of the main fundamental things because something that's cool about the one time pad is if you don't know the key or any information about the message it is a hundred percent secure and it's theoretically impossible to crack because every possible input message is just as likely as every possible output message, right? There's no differentiation. You can make it, if I wanted to guess what the key is, I can make it say whatever I wanted. Is there any uh, questions on this before we continue? It's, it's quite the jump from uh, classical ciphers now that we're using actual computing terms. No, I think we're good, okay. So you say like, okay, that's simple. It's just uh, XOR.
But now we do stuff like block functions, right? So how does BOO reveal about text and test? Uh, so we got a question real quick. So if I just do some lines, I'll move this up. Um, so if we were to get the intercept this message, right? And we convert it to hex because, right, we, we, would, we would intercept it as hex, right? Or just read it as hex. So we know um, the message is intended to be four bytes long uh, because one time pad doesn't change the length of it at all. But if we were to XOR the two ciphertext we got, right, and we saw that it was only two bytes, um, the reason it's two bytes is because Python just cuts off the leading zeros, but we could tell that anything that's a zero would be the same thing. Because if I XOR anything with itself, right, so if I um, do 5 XOR 5, right, anything XOR with itself will always be zero. So the fact that we know that there's zero bytes in the message means that those characters in the message are the same. Right, and anything that's different is we know they only differ by that much. Right, so if I do uh, ord of x, right, which just gives me the ASCII value, right, and then I do ord of s, it, it, it shows you, like, there's such a slight difference. Or sorry, not ord, minus, it should be xor, right. So 11 in hex is B, right? So you can tell that's the bit difference. So that also gives you a key on what differs in the two messages. So usually you can say if they're both ASCII, right? Uh, the highest bit, because ASCII is usually represented in seven bits, but you pad it to eight because a byte is eight bits. So you can usually tell the upper bit's always the same. Um, and then, you know, letter analysis, you look at what the letter is in binary and you'll see instead of doing uh, frequency analysis based off what letters you're using, right, frequency analysis on the letters, now we're doing them on the individual bits of the letters. And uh, that can reveal quite a lot. So block ciphers are essentially binary equations on steroids. So we call them block ciphers because if we were to have a 32-byte message, we would encrypt it 16 bytes at a time, right? So it's just like you do it in parts. Um, and it's not... So I put this up purposely to confuse you because I don't want to explain how any of this works. But essentially, the innards of a block cipher are just super confusing binary equations that will XOR it with stuff. So it's random, right? These Ks stand for the keys that you'll use. So you XOR it with random values that you don't know you shuffle them in these S boxes, you diffuse them, which means replacing. So if I have the number 57 and this S box spits out a 57, always replace it with a 143, right? It's just basically a lookup table to switch the values and to make it more complicated. And there's tons of papers and uh, analysis of like how secure these are. And you go into things called uh, linear differential cryptoanalysis, but that's so out of scope and that's like graduate level stuff. But it's super interesting uh, if anyone wants to learn about that later. But basically, all you need to know is like compared to the one time pad, which is simply XOR, you can do so much more uh, bit changes with block ciphers um, that will just completely switch it up. And the practical applications of this are um, web applications use this all the time just to encrypt anything like photos uh cookies right uh one time paths are more for independent messages right so if i'm using an irc channel right i'll use one time paths to do it because they're very fast compared to anything else it's the smallest amount of encryption you can have it's just a simple xor um so compared to the you know binary operations of the XOR and the block ciphers, uh, computers also allow us to do a ton of math, right? And that's the other side of modern computing is pure math. So for people that don't know, uh, we'll just go briefly explain modular math, right? Uh, so if you, you can think about it like a clock, right? It's also called the remainder function. So if I go around the clock, I'll eventually always come back. So if I'm doing mod seven, I limit myself to the numbers zero through six, and then I'll come back to zero. Uh, so like seven mod seven is zero because I will divide by seven and take the remainder. 
And the important fact is you can add, subtract, and multiply, but you can't divide. And uh, we'll go into that later. Um, the whole dividing part is just because if I want to divide, let's say, uh, 6, right? If I wanted to divide 6 mod 7, there's multiple possibilities of what could multiply to it due to the fact that I'll continue around the loop, right? And it's a very good trapdoor function, right? So the, the whole part of modern math is based off uh, exponents and repeated multiplication. So if I have 5 uh, squared mod 7, that'll be 4, right? Because 5 squared is 25. Uh, and if I do 25 remainder 7, 4, right? And if I do 2 squared, it's also 4. So it, it's the whole point that given the exponent, I can have multiple possible bases. And each one's equally likely. Um, and then there's also this one. There's no inherent uh, ambiguity, but it's very hard to calculate if I have an exponent of a number, right? So because 827 is prime, this is given to exist. That's a little off topic, but we'll just take it for granted, right? 2 to some power x will give me 536, right? But to find out what x is, um, I have to try out every combination pretty much until I find it, which doesn't sound bad, right? This is very doable. We could do, right, we'll write something in Python. Range, uh, we said 827, right? If uh, power of 2i modular 827 equals 536, print right and we get 470 so we we know it exists and the proofs behind that are getting into group theory so we won't we won't get into it right now but if you want to learn more about crypto that's one of the first things to learn is why this works so this basically just shows the principle that um you know th this is easy to calculate right but if i were to make this modular number thousands of bits long right because if we could do 827.bit length. We, this is only a 10 bit number, right? So if we do pow 2 to the 1000, right? So suddenly, what if we, what if I give you this number, right? And you have to find out that equation. You have to try all, this is way too much to try. And there's also going back to the idea of dividing, right? Because dividing is ambiguous and not one-to-one. -one. Usually we just find uh, a value so that if we have our G, we find another value uh, that will equal to one. And this is always possible if our mod is a prime number. So if people want to just try this real quick, three times D equals one mod 13. Right. Um, and while people do this, I'm just going to say, like, modular math uh, is so important because, let me let me go into it. So, like, the encryption, the main encryptions they use it is elliptical curves, Diffie-Hellman, and uh, RSA, right? And those three things combined make up almost all internet connection, right? So if I want to connect to a website, I verify that it's that website through RSA. If I want my phone to connect to anything... Uh, I use elliptical curves because it's a little smaller memory usage. But my phone essentially uses elliptical curves for every single connection. Um, when your computer does RSA because it's more it's, it's more secure, but it also is more power consumption. And uh, we'll actually we'll learn Diffie-Hellman in the next slide or two. And that is used for uh, sharing information. So one thing I want to cover real quick is so for things like the block cipher um and the xor right you need a share key right because the whole point is no one can decrypt it unless they know the secret information but you need a way to share that secret information right so what you do is you come up with schemes based off modular math um where you and your partner both share information and then you use uh that information that's shared to compute your own private information, but you make sure that's mathematically equivalent. So you can't 
anyone that's listening can't do it, but since you have some private information yourself, uh, you can compute it yourself. Yep, the challenge answer is 9, because uh, 3 times 9 is 27, mod 13, you just subtract 26. Um, so this is Diffie-Hellman. This is going to be the last major thing we cover for today, right? Um, and it, it's very, it's usually described in paint for some reason, right? Uh, of adding paint colors and then sharing them. So what you do is you have your common paint uh, that everyone knows. You add your secret color um, and you share the mixture, right? So you take the other person's public color you add your secret, and you should have the same thing, right? Uh, we'll go into this more mathematically, but like this is a good representation. Yeah, so someone's saying for the modular inverse, right? So 9 works as a solution, but it's not always uh, unique. Because if I did, if I added 13 and I did 21, right? Oh, no, I screwed up my math. 22. Uh, this would also give me 1. But... The f effect is 22 is the same thing as 9 because you're already in mod 13. So if we go Diffie-Hellman at its core is working on modular math and we'll look at why it works. Um, this will be the only cipher we talk about like in depth uh, the exact uh, implementation. Like after this you'll be able to do it yourself. Um, and it's mostly used for key sharing. So if I want to use AES and block ciphers that use a the same key for encryption and decryption, I will use this um, because I can share some public information that is fine. Uh, and then once we have the shared common secret that we calculate on our own computers, we can use that to communicate and share AES keys, which are faster to use later on. Right. So the first step is Alice generates a prime P, a base value G, and a private exponent A, right? And that'll look like this, right? And then she calculates a calc uh, capital A, right? And she'll send out all that information public. So if we just go back to the paint, right? P, the prime number, and uh, G, which we call a generator for reasons you'll learn later, um, is the common paint, right? And that private exponent is your secret color. So both Alice and Bob both make this, right? And they calculate uh, A and capital B, respectively, with their private exponent. Now, the reason why this is secure is because given G, P, and capital A, finding lowercase a is insanely hard. Because we'll go back to this, right? If I give you a thousand bit prime, this is going to take thousands of years to calculate. Right, unless you have a secret trick or you know it. So if we go back, you both share the uh, result of raising g to your private exponent, and then we just do some like basic math to where we raise b to the a and a to the b. So I was just going to paint just to make it a little more clear, right? So a equals g to the lowercase a, right? and b equals g to the lowercase b. Um, and if you're Alice, you'll have the information a, capital A, uh, g, p, right? And you'll have b. And then if you're Bob, you have the same thing, but this will be a, b instead, right? So if we have g to the a, which is also equivalent to a, and we raise both to the b, right? That's just the equivalent of g to the a, b. Uh, and if, if we do for Bob, we'll do G to the B to the A. I'm sorry, this probably sounds like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, right? It's just, this is the notation, right? So you can see they come up with the same result using the public information that one person sends and the private information of the other. And then if I was to listen to the communication, right, and I was only to get this, I would have G, P, A, and b when these two are uppercase but i wouldn't have the private exponent to be able to calculate the shared secret so it's inherently okay to share this information right and uh that, that'll be foolproof in letting you uh 
you know, establish a secure connection. Unless there's someone man in the middle and literally replacing your packets. Yeah, no. Diffie Hellman, for some reason, is always explained with paint. I do not know why. So, uh, if we go back, right? So this may, you, you end up with a shared K value. Uh, and that K value, you know, it's just a number, but what you can do with that is if you were to change that into bytes, we can toss that into, uh, AES and then start encrypting other stuff, or we can use it in a random number generator in a seed to start generating stuff. So it's essentially like one number shared in secrecy will let you generate a lot more. Oh, oh I, I get the pun now. Yeah, I, I did use Microsoft Paint. Um, right. So yeah, what's the point, right? So the shared secret will let me seed any random numbers or, you know, if I go to the one time pad, what I can do is, so my first message, right? I'll seed it with the key value. I will generate the values I need for my XOR and then I'll generate more to reseed it and you do stuff like that. Or you'll iterate over what your initial key value is. So this this is just like one basic thing, but I think it really points out the importance of modular math. Because if you look at it, right, this is a super basic equation, right? This is, you can do this high school level, it's just exponents. But inherently, this math problem is impossible to solve, AX equals B, right? And you have to find what B is when your mod is very large. If you can figure out how to solve this, you will become a millionaire on the spot. Uh, and NSA will probably abduct you, right? Because if you can solve this, you have broken almost all modern day encryption. So, you know, a lot of actually, though, like a lot of research is going into this right now. So I think um, you say if X is less than like N to the 0 0.292, right? Like that's currently the bound where this is insanely solvable. Or like if F if n minus one is a very large composite number, like it is like the multiple of many and many primes, this can be solved. So it's like, you have to be very careful and I would not recommend trying to just implement this on your own without reading like the papers. Basically I'm saying never make your own crypto system. It'll end horribly, but when it does work, it's almost foolproof. Um, so that's the majority of the talk. Uh, I can answer any questions or explain more of the stuff down here. But basically, there's so much to cryptography that it's going to be impossible to explain every system that exists. But you can try to understand a grab of, you know, this This is some of the math that's involved, uh, the main reasoning behind it. You know, like the, the two types of classic, old style, and the new emerging, where it's very mathematical based. And if you want to get into it, you're just going to be reading math papers. I know I do CTFs personally a lot. And a lot of the modern CTF challenges is like finding this new exploit where it makes it slightly easier to solve or uh, post quantum encryption and like how people have to reinvent the wheel because quantum computers are going to destroy everything. Right? So I think it's a very interesting field, and if anyone is interested in also following it, I can give them a lot of pointers on how to learn more. Yeah, that's the rest of the talk. Anyone have questions before I just end stream and we just move to Discord only? Um, actually, yeah, before I end stream, for people that do want to learn more about crypto, I think the two best resources I've ever found, right, is uh, CryptoHack.org, right? This is a platform challenge that gamifies cryptography, right? So if you go to all these challenges, right, stuff we talked about, right, Diffie-Hellman, uh, Mathematics, RSA, Block Ciphers, it's just a bunch of challenges about real-world exploits, um, on cryptography. Elliptical curves, uh, someone mentioned, are very cool, but they're also insanely complicated, and I cannot fathom my head around a lot of the challenges. But 
th- not this isn't really just like pure understanding. Well, it is pure understanding, but it's practical applications and you'll look through stuff that over the years people have used to like break into YouTube or uh, hijack Twitter accounts. Um, so this is a great one, but this usually is you need a basis understanding. Uh, if you want a more beginner one, Crypto Pals, uh, I recommend because it's more, oh, here is a challenge and now implement your own AES method, right? So it's more uh, learn from the ground up and not already know stuff and exploit it. Can I explain the discrete log problem? Yeah. So discrete log problem is what I was kind of going on before. Maybe I didn't explain it correctly, but um, discrete log problem is if I have this equation, mod, let's say P, um, and I have A, I'm given A, I'm given B, and I'm given P, right? Uh, how do I find X? Right, that's my goal. Um, and there's a lot of methods out there, you know, which is like, it maybe if you pick a bad P, there's some exploit around there, or, you know, there's good ways on how to guess for X, right? But essentially given this, you, you can't find out what X is in a reasonable amount of time, right? The only way you can know it is if you have X from the start, which is why Diffie-Hellman works great because there's two of these equations and you know the result. So you can raise it to your own exponent, but you don't have to share it because, right, I'll, I will get this. I'll send this as a whole, but I won't send the lowercase b. Only I can calculate that on my own. And it's going to be impossible for someone else to calculate that if I do it correctly. Right, and this isn't just using Diffie-Hellman. Uh, this is used in elliptical curves, but that's a little like uh, take that with a grain of salt and like a little star because elliptical curves are uh, very creative in how they define addition and multiplication. Right, because it's not just over numbers. It's a uh, you take the numbers over a curve that looks like this. That that's a whole other stream I could do. Um, but yeah, no, the discrete log problem is essentially how can you reverse modular explanation? Because there's so many different possibilities and it's not a straightforward solution. Because if I were to rewrite this, right, it's a to the x equals uh, b, right? But I can have infinite p's, so I just have kp. And you're solving for too many variables here to be legitimate. Anyone else have questions? Side channel attacks would be uh, certainly something. I was planning on explaining RSA during this stream, but I think that would have been a little out of scope for a beginner. Uh, we can probably have more stuff during the actual CTF. I think that will be good when we have challenges to back up the stream. All right, so I think I'm going to end the stream for now. Um, and if you guys have any questions, just uh, DM me on Discord or talk in the private chat. I'm happy to help. All right, see you guys.